what's really going on everybody back again episode number 83 as always before we get into it be sure to follow us on twitter and instagram at wrgo pod be sure to like listen subscribe and comment on all of your favorite streaming platforms that includes apple Podcasts, spotify soundcloud google play iHeartRadio, and be sure to check out our youtube videos in full where you can watch all of us including henry wearing our shirts like he is right now mackenzie and henry how are you guys i'm doing good henry it's war, baby. Pounding the pavement, man. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so now we're going to go on to food for thought. Uh, I can think everyone has kind of been seeing, if you're on social media, a little bit, uh, especially on Instagram, because there have been some good pictures of this. Uh, the hearing of Katanji Brown Jackson uh, for the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the hearing has been this week. Uh, I think the last question for today. Uh, the hearing has drawn notable press largely for um, a nice little moment uh, between Cory Booker and Ketanji Brown Jackson, kind of understating the history of it. Um, also, Ketanji Brown Jackson talking about her parents. I think that's something that everybody should look up. And uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson talking about her daughters, which kind of led to some nice pictures and stuff. But um, as the hearing, uh, it drew kind of some notable press for Republicans questioning Jackson, which included her religious belief, which I'm pretty sure is unconstitutional. And funny enough, critical race theory, which actually talked about my high school, which is very, very funny. Um, so what what were your kind of takeaways from uh, the hearing? I'm sure we might all have something different to kind of take away, but Mackenzie? Um, I guess my first takeaway, obviously, um, seeing a Black woman even be nominated and even just be in this position is wonderful. Like, I love all the pictures. Um, and I'm just excited to see what she's going to bring to the table. But um, the one thing that did stick out to me was the religious question, because I remember I had overheard um, was it Graham asking him, asking her about it. And I was just like, what is I'm thinking she's I was like, what was her religion? Like to think of like something. Why are you asking that essentially? And I'm like, wow, that was really crazy to me um, that he I said, not that surprising. Um, and also Cory Booker's speech, even though Cory Booker personally, he'd be doing a bit much for me. <laughs> but he he'd be like, just he's so, yeah, he's a good speaker. He'd just be so passionate sometimes, but I really appreciated it. It was beautiful. It honestly made me tear up. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, just seeing a black woman, even in this position and like the pictures and stuff, and we could go back and forth about what's her policies and, you know, yeah. some things that she's done in the past. But I, I'm still always, well, I won't say I'm always going to be for representation matters, but I just, I'm here for it. Yeah, I like that. Um, I think, and, I, and this is why I think like as much as I can like, as much as Cory Booker can be like the butt of a joke, because it seems like he's playing a caricature of someone who like should care about politics, which is hilarious. Um, I kind of got emotional too when he was like, you know, you remind me of my, his mother speaking. And I think that's something that like a lot of Black people can relate to, I'm sure, especially, I don't want to speak for you, Mackenzie, but I'm sure as a woman, as a Black woman, where, you know, oftentimes you all are actually the ones who are the most educated, but getting the least, Mm -hmm. um, it did kind of seem fitting for her, for him to kind of like affirm her of like, you do belong here. And like, this is something you've honestly worked for and like, you're worthy of this, even though all of this other shit is going to say that you're not. I just felt that was like a really like nice thing to like read the room and kind of at least give the historical kind of significance of it. Henry, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, go ahead. Mackenzie. I'll go ahead. Or, well, I was just going to say, yeah, and just like, it just showed like, wow, like I have your back in this room. And also I just feel like, especially like we all, well, I, and, and when I see another black girl or another black person in the space, especially working in white spaces and I see somebody, I always try to back them up. If they, especially if I feel like they're putting their neck out there. That actually happened recently at work. I felt like this woman, she was pitching a lot of ideas and the, why people were just like, it was so much. And I'm just going to back her up because I feel like, like what Cory Booker was really doing just overall, like I'm here, I support you. You're re- you, you deserve to be here. Like you said, and like, I got your back. Yeah. Henry, anything kind of stick out to you, at least like for the hearing or conversations like on social media? Cause I know a lot of people were talking about it. Um, well, I would be honest and say, I did not watch the hearing because I mean, bro, y'all didn't, Y'all know where my focus is right now. So with that being said, what I have grasped with social media, I wasn't surprised with how the Republicans try her so hard. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like just asking dumb remedial questions and then white men being blatantly rude to a woman, let alone a black woman, how like they're constantly interrupting her and not letting her finish her point. Um, That's like 
most of what I've been able to grasp from the like clips and stuff I watched. Um, I heard a little bit of Corey's thing. It was like, I'm not gonna lie, <laughs> giving like he too passionate. So I like exited out the clip and saved it so I can watch it later. Um, but I would just kind of, I guess, piggyback on what Mackenzie said in terms of like not feeling like the only one in the room. Um, because we know how many black senators it is and you know what I'm saying how many people are legitimately asking her rational questions versus just crazy stuff to get clickbait and make her seem like she's like Noah said not qualified and she doesn't deserve to be in the room um yeah that's my take I will say like again her record is giving um big sis in the white house but the funny thing is, I'm actually curious. I mean, and I think this is like the one thing, and I and I wonder because I think this is like a conversation that I would love to have with someone who's actually like put in that work to like find that out. Because I feel like at a certain point, I feel like if people realize like if you're going to be a judge, what do you the what what is the work what is the work that you're likely going to do? And I I feel like at least on my standpoint is that people are criticizing her for being a judge and working on the sentencing commission without actually realizing like what that means and what she can actually control because it's like if you're work on the sentencing commission your job is literally to work on sentencing so naturally an extension of that is going to be hey and i think she talked about this in the hearing where she's like i'm going to try to be lenient because i look at i'm not just going to throw the book at people because that's a problem and yada yada yada. but i i feel like i don't know uh, because he chimed in but i feel like people are kind of just like oh well she's a judge or she was this so naturally she's like the ops and like I'm not saying that that's not the case I haven't done my research but I feel like people are too quick to jump from point a to not even point b but to some other point without necessarily drawing a clear line but I mean granted that's just kind of politics in the social media age I guess I'll let me I mean I also uh, what would you say I said I was just gonna let you go before I get my time. Oh, I mean, I just feel like it's also like the argument if if can you can you change the system within the system? Mm -hmm. And I do feel like I, I mean there's both sides of the coin. That's not even an argument we can really um that's not really an argument that we can really um finish tonight. Cause I mean I do feel like there are both ways to look at it. Um, but I really do think it's just the fact that you, if you don't feel like some people feel like I have to see, have a seat at the table to change the table. And honestly, in some instances, I feel like I'm that type of person, but there's some people who feel like, no, you don't got to do it. You got to stick it to the man every single chance you get. It. And sometimes that works, but sometimes it doesn't get you to where you might want to go. But I do, I see both sides to it, but really? I mean, well, I do feel like to what y'all said about what we said about Kamala, cause it seemed like somebody switching on me but what'd you say um, no, wait, wait what go on what'd you say <laughs> we need to go listen to the Kamala episode uh sound like somebody switching but, on me. but but I will say this Kamala is different because she was a prosecutor there was like actionable stuff of like not the same okay, role. I guess that's where <laughs> I'm totally, going with totally it. that's where I'm going with it though no because like kind of women can say like you can't stick it to the man and like you had to play the conservative politics. I was arguing this for Kamala's fact of like, bro, she did it, but she can't. But Miss Katanji is a judge. And the difference between a prosecutor and a judge, per my understanding of while working in the legal system, <clears throat> is that a judge actually has, you know, like the leeway to maybe like change some stuff actually. So I do like, command I guess the fact of like her not throwing a book at people but on the flip side it's like well if she's like the highest like league like she's essentially about to be at the highest legal uh bench in this country so like if you're not going to like hard focus on certain issues it is kind of problematic for me because that's why I want you there we can't keep playing this conservative politics game i was trying i i can hear it for kamala because like you just to figure here you think she's conservative politics yeah. though yeah, because, and then i was what i was going to say was that i think it's it's kind of like you know six in one hand half a dozen in the other possibly because if you don't kind of i don't think she's conservative i think she just played this a certain way right. that's saying, more so what i mean but that's yeah. what, uh, no but what i'm saying is that if she would have been kind of on some like i'm gonna like basically blow this shit up 
she's not getting she nominated. Be where she at? So she's like, yeah, nominated. I agree. I get both sides of it, but I guess her going into this, you need an agenda plan. You know what I'm saying? Like because I, I wait, well, you don't think she? You don't think she risk, like? Bro. It's too much at risk from uh, she like she she wouldn't get nominated if she was like. This is my plan. Like you can't. I know, and that's the like. That's what I'm saying. Well, what do you plan. think her plan should be, though? Like, what what do you mean plan? Like, for like, what would you like for her to? Black man, I definitely would like to see something in regards to like sentencing change, sentences, oh, sentences overall changing, uh, and like how they do like these minimums, uh, how parole and all of that Funny stuff. Enough, she actually, she actually did talk about that. Or at least not in terms of like, because, and she haven't like said this when they were asking her, like she doesn't control what the sentence is. She just as a judge controls, okay, here's my wiggle room of what you're allowing me to do. I'm going to pick where within that. And right. my understanding is that throughout her career, she was just like, okay, I'm going to look at every individual case and not just say, here's the maximum 15 years, fuck it. Let me actually like try to see where this person slots. And I think what she would probably add on if she were not, you know, applying for this job is that throwing the max doesn't do anything. It just. Oh, okay. So maybe I need to shut up and go listen to her for real. Uh, Cause again, my, my perspective has been based on like just social media for it. Cause I haven't been looking at it like that. Um, I, would yeah. en- I would encourage people to at least look at her and her answers on sentencing. I think it, it shows at least a different side of, what she well, yeah, I, that's what I'm saying. Like, from what I've been able to grasp, she plays by, you know what I'm saying? She played by that, that little thin line of, like, in this, like, that little, like, hmm. And I guess that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I want hard, intentional, like, this is what I'm going to do or plan to do or want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I haven't heard that from what I've been able to grasp from, like, the hearing. So maybe I need to go listen a little bit more and I'll gain that clarity. But I mean, I'm definitely glad as a black woman, like don't get me wrong. No. Um, I'm so glad as a black woman who is more like liberal than conservative. I'm just saying like, how long do us as black people who are at the table play the like, give a little, get a little game? You know, that's- yeah, I do. You, so you're saying how long until somebody just breaks through? Yeah, that, that was one of that. Yeah, I mean, hope, I mean, I hope to, I like to think that hopefully we are moving towards we are pushing the needle forward. Or, I mean, I hope. But you got to start with one. You got to start somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to get in there first. Yeah, and the fact that it's just now we're getting the one is in twenty twenty two. Nuts. Yeah. Um. So this is something that I feel like is around if you're in certain spaces, but this is something that I think is going to come up more. Uh, if you are not aware, there is currently a bill that is being passed in the Florida State House that is called the Don't Say Gay Bill. Um, so basically, uh, black and brown students in elementary age in, in Florida, they're on edge as the state advances a bill that would uh, basically ban instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, basically, this takes a lot of interesting roads and in basically how people who are LGBTQ plus or identify as such can basically be discriminated against. And I think this kind of goes into a longer kind of thing that we've talked about on this podcast, at least about education and quote unquote rights and kind of how that gets misconstrued. Um, I would like to hear y'all thoughts on the bill or if you have any, or just what are you kind of thinking about the bill? Seems like a kind of a, kind of a clusterfuck to be honest, but. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it sounds like a lot, but from my understanding, they, they're trying to like stop the use of that word. They, I mean, like you mean like pronouns and pronouns and stuff? Yeah, all that stuff. Base, I mean, basically, and it's, I think it's setting up, my, from my understanding, if a child is, if a child identifies as LGBTQ+, basically the teacher in the, the teacher in this case cannot do anything inside of the classroom environment to basically like accommodate protect, the child. protect or protect the child just in general they can't say like hey this student chooses to identify as such we are going to here is why and it's basically just kind of leaving the child out to this stuff about to come out but <clears throat> on one end on the flip i'm not too too like mad because Listen, y'all don't like bum me on this, but like for me, especially as a bisexual male, like 
I understand certain things in my childhood definitely allow me to like mentally explore way before I even understood what sexuality was. So I personally have always had like a, you know, like a, I don't shy or timid approach to like allowing kids to explore as early as elementary. So like, that's like the personal, but on like the like political correct standpoint, I don't think this bill is like progressive at all because it's just gonna open room, like you said, to like more people being, you know, disenfranchised, bullied. And we already know that like, you know, suicide is big in young black people. Um, so like, let's just put this on top of you not being able to express yourself. You know how many people like kill themselves behind their sexuality because they're not, you know, they don't feel comfortable. They don't feel accepted or welcome, welcome or seen. <clears throat> so with that being the case, it's like a, I guess it's the Kitanji thing. Like it's a, like, <laughs> like in the middle, because I, I grew up a certain way. I grew up in a Southern household with Christian values and like that stuff was kind of, it wasn't forced on me, but that's that's my root. So at my oh, wait, root, what are you saying? Are yeah, you saying that you? I said both you, is how I feel. But I no, are you saying that you? But are you saying that you are okay with the ideas going on in Florida? If like not, no, I'm not saying. I'm saying this deal is harmful. That's what I'm saying. Because it sounds like because I mean like, and this is not even like attack. I'm trying to like. It sounds like you're using the backdrop of your childhood to then kind of as a contrast to what this bill would do, right? Um, To one degree or another, it's like a, I was, I put my, my personal feelings out there by saying I can kind of like, I mean, okay, like, you know, I'm not bothered by it. That That's what I was saying at oh. first in terms of like my, how I, my roots. And mm -hmm. then I was explaining like my like moral conscious knows and like, this isn't right because I know what could come behind it. I.e., why I was explaining like suicide and growing mm -hmm. up and all that shit, all that stuff. So that's why I was trying to. Um, well, I didn't try. I explained both sides of how I felt about it. I'm not sure if you guys caught on. I mean, I mean, I guess I agree. Like, I don't support that. I don't think that's inclusive to kids. And also, just on a, the basic level. Why do people care so much? Like, I just feel like I literally don't, I, I just personally, if a person wants to be identified as a, especially in a school setting, I do feel like you really can't, you're telling the teacher not to even say like, hey, they want to be referred to as such and such now. Like, it's that, that's such a political statement. That's such a big deal to make a bill and like rob people of just choosing something. Like, it, I don't think it's that serious. And I hate to say, not saying that that's that serious, but it's just shocking that damn. It's petty. It's it's very- Yeah, it's, it's very petty to me. Petty. Um, petty. Yeah. I mean, Florida yeah. is a petty state. Yeah, and it's Florida, yeah. so I guess I'll check that. <laughs> but no, like, I mean, yeah, like for me, it's, and also that's why I said like, it's like, I think some, me and my friends were talking about this the other day, and we probably like even highlighted when we talk about like the new great migration or whatever, but like Southern, you know, like black culture is really Southern culture for real, right? So when you analyze like how black on some, like for real, we can, that's a conversation. I'm ready to go to that. We'll sidebar that. Okay. Yeah, okay. But point, um, I said that to say like, when you look at like, I guess how geographically we spread out in like Southern people are the most like conservative. They're the most uptight. They're the most like stick to what like mama taught you and uncle, you know what I'm saying? All the stuff that got passed down through generations, stuff like that. So like this coming out of Florida in the environment that I, again, grew up in, came back to is starting to like, okay, I see what, you know what I'm saying? Just understanding certain nuances of life and stuff. I see again what the state that's doing it, not surprised by it. So that's again, it's like <clears throat> this is in line with Southern culture for real. You know what I'm yeah. saying? That's this is not something you talk about. This is not something you showcase. This is not something you should be proud of. You're gonna be shunned to hell and burned with it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, like people be going. Yeah. I'm not using that as justification to pass this bill because it shouldn't be passed, because that's like. That's like saying like they pass a bill and say 
I ain't gonna say that because that's too tricky. But point in case, you can't do this. You can't do this. That's yeah, not, it's, it's not right. It's not the right. Thing it's is, not, like I just don't know how. I don't know how it's not like unconstitutional. Like on the surface, it's basically saying like, "Hey, we're not gonna like do this." I don't. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, no law degree, but who am I? Um, I think the sad thing is, and I think this is where like I think a lot of white people who are advocating for the bill get it. I think wrong in terms of messaging of like, oh well, you know, it does. It limits this, this, and this, which I think is large. It's true. It does limit, I think, how kids can be protected. But to your point, Henry, I think you brought up a great point of like the actual harm for black and brown kids who identify as such because they're always the worst or who always receive the worst in terms of like bullying, you know, mental health issues, suicide, all that is worse for people who look like us. And I think that they would have, to me, people who are advocating for this bill to go bad would have a, a lot more success, I think. If they were basically just like this bill structurally is racist and the people yeah. who are, the people who are going to suffer from this look like us because if you think that these white kids don't have enough protection imagine throwing all the shit look, that- now, look, to be the devil advocate yeah here. when we talk about it's racist what black organization is going to like this is going to be their you know they're going to champion this and challenge this bill to where and, they stop. And, and the funny thing is i would totally agree with you i think not enough black like the naacp should get in on this like all these they organizations. Not. but but that's a problem that's a, a lot hey, of I'm just it, pointing them out no I, I no the funny thing is i agree with you most people not enough people a lot of you know when we talked when we talked about this a lot of, and this is not a criticism or trying to compare struggles. It's like a lot of LGBTQ plus organizations do not often think about how black people are impacted within their I own. I was just life. about to say that. A That's probably why. Organizations do not consider LGBTQ yeah, plus. We, we see black. these issues as separate and not intersectional when like they are very much intersectional. Yeah. yeah. To be frank, that's what the whole Dave Chappelle issue was about. It was about, he saw yeah. these people who were not also black and he, like, that's the issue is that people can be black and queer. So imagine suffering from being queer. Imagine suffering from being black. Merge those two things together, and they're kind of like no country for the wild, where no one's really protecting. And that's the, yeah. the issue. But back to Henry's statement about uh, about everything comes from the South. So there's a great article uh, that Henry flagged to us that we thought came out this week, but actually came out in January. But we're going to flag it anyway. Uh, it is basically about uh, finding the new black mecca in black migration. Um, I will drop this link in the description because I think it's one of the most interesting things I've read in a long time. Um, yeah. It talks about how cities like where McKenzie lives in New York, uh, LA and Chicago are becoming less black um, as, you know, kind of people leave the cities that their elders move to. Uh, Guess where they're coming. What do you say? Guess where they're coming. Oh, uh, we're getting there. So, <laughs> cities, so cities with decreasing black populations since 1990. This is what I found super interesting. New Orleans, D.C., Richmond, Detroit, Houston, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and L.A. Cities with increasing Black populations since 1990 are Memphis, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Miami, Dallas, Columbus, and Minneapolis. Um, the highlights are that the percent of Black people living in the South since 1990 has doubled uh, or has gone up and has doubled in Atlanta. Um, of course, the context of this is when Blacks left the South, uh, they went everywhere, depending on where you were from, like, for example, uh, on my mom's side, we were from North Carolina. We went up I-95 to D.C. and New York. And my dad's side, we're from Michigan, and we were slaves in Kentucky, and we went north until we couldn't go further north. Um, so a lot of people went west. Some people went north. Mackenzie, I'm sure there's an interesting story about how yeah. you, people got to New York and where you all are, where y'all are. Uh, and Henry's people just said, fuck it, we'll chill here. Hold um, on, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't, don't even do that, buddy. Can my granddad own the whole 10 acres in South Georgia? Wait, that was funny. No, that was yeah. not funny. That, um, that was, was funny, funny, bro. Yeah. Oh, that was, that funny, was funny. I'll go. Your, your people, it's fine. It's fine because I guess we all return it anyway. So it don't even matter. It, it, it all tells a story. It all, there it don't is, even matter. Yeah, people, black people from LA all came from Texas and New Orleans. Like, it's just everybody yeah. from somewhere. No, I'm not offended. I was joking. And I guess, like, people may be listening or whatever. So, like, this came up because somebody from Boston or something moved down here. And, you know, we, uh, I mean, we're cool because we met in D.C. And then we both moved down here around the same time. So the point is, he, he said something about, like, black people uh, succeed more in Atlanta or it's the wealthiest. I'm like, 
that's not accurate. Black people as a majority, like when you compare like wealth, is not that that scale that no i feel like that article definitely said like people black people are thriving in atlanta yeah you can come here and have more opportunity but if you're not like of the black elite what's the likelihood unless you have well, like, then that's but that yeah that's always that, another conversation that's also everywhere and i think what they're saying is yeah that it has more black elite um than most places it's not like well yeah i can agree with that point but i guess i don't like the idea that gets painted on social media like this is the black mecca. You can come here and psh, I'm the man. I'm the man. I mean, but, but I will say, no, it's not. I don't think it's wrong. Yeah, I don't think it's wrong because when they were saying things about like um, Charlotte and the guy quoted like he came from New York to Charlotte when he was going to nice restaurants and speakeasies where the drinks are expensive. You don't really walk in and see a crowd of, of a black like a black place super all black or whatever he goes down to charlotte all the speakeasies all the uh, expensive restaurants that you don't normally see in new york or that you see in new york but they're normally all white charlotte anywhere it's black and stuff and so you I, you really not, don't have that like, black ownership is higher here black businesses higher here for sure what i'm like the point i guess not even i guess i'm making here is minimum wage is 725 in georgia so if you are of the people that is from here, like not people moving here, but Atlanta, in whatever they, you know, I'm already said I'm not from Atlanta. So point AT aliens, that's what they call themselves. My bad. AT aliens. If you're not an AT alien, like from, you know what I'm saying? The city. Transplants. What if you not, I don't want to say local, but you if you ain't a if local, you're not from the city. Yeah, like it's it's not as easy as someone moving from a DC a New York. A but LA. I was still once I again think. not to cut you. Go ahead. Not to cut you off, but I feel like that's the same. I've heard that story in New York, like especially people who mm-hmm. lived born and raised in New York. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting, like, especially in my dating experience, like meeting people who have well, not like <laughs> But um, okay. Now y'all doing the most. Now y'all doing the most. Uh, but no, like seriously, and it's, it's just talking about people, talking to people who've been born and raised here, even went to school, came back, and then seeing the progression of people who just moved to New York and came here for the job, and they just climbing the corporate ladder. It is a different experience from people who've been born and raised. But it is also interesting to see that perspective and talk about that perspective because my New York and their New York is two totally different things because I've been able, I, I really came here for a job and I'm working up the ladder. You have family here. You have a little bit more connection here. I mean, I don't know, but I feel like that is still everywhere though. Like, yeah, I, mean, I'm not, I don't disagree with you. I guess it just irritate, it, 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 it just irritate me that everybody literally think I'm coming to Atlanta and I'm about to be the next big thing. I mean, I, I I mean, I think that's just a... What's wrong with that, though? I mean, I do feel like the way it's giving, though, like, I definitely, maybe if I didn't work in, like, if Atlanta became, like, a real media empire or whatever, yeah. I definitely feel like I could move down there and really make some moves. Right? And I'm not, I'm no, not no, I just it's... feel like... That's what I genuinely you, maybe like this that. is just me saying I'm tired of the traffic. I'm tired of the inflation. My rent, my 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 apartment. Yeah, that's this the apartment thing, that's should not what, be more than fourteen hundred dollars. Now that's the, the part I am interested in, though. The, since the pandemic started, and everybody and their mama want to move from where are y'all New from? York, DC, New York, yeah. mainly New York and DC. Yeah, Y'all it's a lot of people from here. here. You're increasing the pricing, but they're not paying more shorty. Again, my apartment yeah. is going for eighteen fifty. No, and that's I'm what the outskirts. Um, my friend, I have a friend, uh, Yana Berlin. She just matched, and she was looking at buying houses in um, Durham, North Carolina, and um, even in townhouses. I mean, it's still probably relative, but I mean, they still like four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, downtown. Oh, also those home. Asterisk, home. asterisk mark, asterisk mark, asterisk mark. Townhomes, though, like in places like that are nor- like new. You know, people normally just do like detached I, homes. I, that I, so look, Mackenzie, you but yeah, tell you about my home, like me attempting. Yeah, to- that's why I mentioned it. So what I'm saying is, let's say before the pandemic in my same area, I could like what I qualify for, I could have bought a house. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying, like, where, let, how y'all saying, like, it's easy to, like, easy, that's why people come here, because it's cheaper to live, it's, yeah. you know, home ownership is higher, business 
uh, you can get a, whatever, thrive easier with your business. Point is like more people moving here increases uh, uh, that dude, Arthur, whatever, the dude that bought the Mercedes, uh, built Arthur Nash, something like that. He built a Mercedes thing about a couple of years ago. He bought all of that area down there, right? So like they were already intentionally planning development. This stuff has been planned for years. So like more companies, more businesses, all this stuff gets invested into the city. And now you're increasing the price of living, not for the people that's from here or live here or the ATLians. You increase it for Tom and Sue from that's just, okay. I mean, but once again, I think that's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> market, that's just market trends. I mean, think about it. I'm people just tired of the traffic, bro, bro. I was 20 minutes away from my house just now. It took me 45 minutes to get home because it's too much traffic. Go, stop coming, bro. The inflation is ridiculous. They not like this. It's it's kind of like it things ebb and flow. Like people used to live in DC. I mean, people still live in DC and people still live in New York and they're still coming, but like not as much. So people are going back down to the south. And I'm sure at a certain point in time, stuff up here, depending on where you are. Will get cheaper. People will realize, oh shoot, it's a little high up here. They'll come rushing back up, and it's yeah. just, people are going to go where they think they can get them, yeah, where they can stretch it the most. Or so, or and so. I think I think the migration is a thing. Like I think people over years migrate and move to different places, and just like I think it will repeat itself again. But I am just curious overall because the biggest thing though to move to the south was because it's affordable. So I am curious to you know, how that's going to change the idea of even moving to the South, because the biggest thing was because it's affordable and you get more space. But if you are paying the same price, you know, as in New York, as these other cities, it's kind of like, well, damn. And I think What's also, Henry, to, and to Henry, to another point, I think if you're if you're here, if you're, if you're in a New York, a Baltimore, if you're kind of on that I-95 corridor where there are a lot of Black people and there are a lot of college-educated, well-earning Black people, if you want to go down to the South, to be honest, there are only so many places you can go and recreate something a little bit similar. And Atlanta's- and That's what I've been trying to tell people too. DC, it's, a, it's a map game. It's honestly a map DC game. Like Black and conservative and educated in the little bourgeoisie. Atlanta is Black and ghetto. And these these folks, they, they, they like put it on that yeah. they got it. I be seeing videos. Y'all need to tighten up down there. But I love my brothers and sisters. Nothing to do is say is people from Atlanta. It be everybody else and their mama doing that. Oh no! And we what we not about to do is blame all of that foolishness on the transplant because that is definitely after the fool. I went through any video you sent me and I listened to this person. I can tell you straight up, bro, ain't from here, and that's a fact, bro. You ain't finna sit here and tell me Atlanta folks is not. Please send all ATL fighting right. videos. Unless you're on the West End, unless you're in the West on the West Side. Send them to the WRGO pod. Mackenzie and I will personally yeah. send them to Henry. We'll personally do that. Hey, well, yeah. Because I had to put yeah. that accent on for you. Because what you're not going to do is act like we ain't got no home training. Uh, you know, we videos, know, you know, we're open. Personal video. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about, Henry. Oh, that, then I, be Atlanta shorties in the videos fighting in Waffle House. Stop playing. Bro, I'm going to tell you it be the other folks coming down here that don't know how to act. We have, like, for instance, I have, like, y'all know how I used to be like, yes, sir, no, sir, thank you. I I, ha I have manners. I'm a mannerable guy. I literally, hey. what? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm waiting to see how yeah. you Yeah. <laughs> get to the point. Point is that, like, Southern hospitality, you know, that's the thing. That's that was the point. That that's slowly going away because it be people from everywhere else. Like I do Uber. 90% of the people in my car is not from me. Well, obviously, because they in an Uber and you should have a car if you live in Georgia. <laughs> hey. What are you talking oh, about? Hey. Oh, Thanks. <laughs> Walking about stop moving here. That that's why I'm saying that's my whole point of everything I said. Like, listen, you, listen, like, y'all better get y'all money. If it's a black mecca, people need to because I think when I was reading that, it was like, damn, as a person who lives in New York, and you kind of do gotta find the pockets where the black people really be, and like the black people, that's my type of vibe, okay. I don't always want to go to the Bronx. I don't always want to go out all the way out to Brooklyn. I don't like easily. I can walk into any bar and it's going to be black people there. I like that. I don't um, have to go to like that random spot on a super, on a, a specific night to make sure it's black people. There. And that's really how it be in other cities. Like 
It's annoying. All my New Yorkers find Mackenzie on Fordham Road and 155th. Well, I'll yeah. just say, okay. oh, hold on. Now I'll be on Fordham Road. In the Bronx. <laughs> Everybody in the Bronx, hit us up with your favorite <laughs> car. It's going to come through. Dominican Day Parade. Oh, that? uh, that's too good for you? Uh, oh, if, if, if you know New York, you don't go I'm to the Bronx. I'm just going to tell you. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, you don't go to the Bronx. I'm just telling Bronx. you, yeah. Okay, that was maybe an exaggeration. I've been to Dyke, Michigan. No, Actually, I guess that's no, it's not, not really the Bronx. Don't lie. Don't care. Dyke, you gotta cast me. I've been to the Bronx a few times. Look, I'm good in any hood, first and foremost. Let's. <laughs> okay, Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, right. super tired of hearing my loud laugh. We got to hit y'all with this. Like, I'm gonna keep it a buck. It sounds like you just need to move from Atlanta. Everybody in the comments, at this point, yeah, everybody, because what you sound like, I don't, don't, black I don't, don't want to be here. here no more. Like, I'm tired of people moving here. Hit me. What's that move? Where take your tone. I'm tired of the hey, you don't even, I'm, what I'm so sick of is the natives, the natives not knowing the move. I know. Why don't you know the move? Not, not the moves. Henry the makes plain is that his Uber pickup doesn't have an Atlanta accent. I think it's time for you to go, bro. I want to talk to my folks. Like, you know what I'm saying? You know where they be at, don't you? <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> you know, man. Nah. Oh, speaking of which, sidebar, you need to, um, I heard they changing the West End, actually, in Atlanta. Point. They, they doing a new model. That, it, the only that's the that's like probably yeah. the only place that I could say in Atlanta that has not been touched. The pocket of Atlanta that hadn't been touched or them white folks coming and they yeah. hungry. And y'all, 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 y'all just everybody saying. doing that. I'm like, I'm like, no, no I'm we, just we, saying. We, Shawty, we got this. We got this. Push back. Move, move. We don't need y'all. I mean, Henry, <laughs> I live in DC. Mackenzie lives in New York. It's already done. Once, once something, yeah. happens, you can't control it. Just get along for the ride. No, seriously, I like. I don't care. That's why when I talk to people who's like born and raised in New York, and they talk about places like Brooklyn or whatever, where they never even grew up seeing a white person, and now it's whole fucking neighborhoods. Oh, didn't mean the whole neighborhood where it's literally only white people. It's yeah. crazy. And yeah, if you go like four, they're four, coming. Four float. Yeah, sure. That's over there. <laughs> they're crazy. Hey, no, it's scary. Fine. We're going to move on to the heads up. Henry, uh, or actually Mackenzie, do Just you to clarify, we don't have no problem with others or YTs or nothing like that. We're just saying, you know, the comfortability of being around our own cultures and all. I think but you're saying I'm it. putting a disclaimer out there. Yeah, I think you're saying it made it a little bit hot, but you know. Yeah, what, what you mean? I folk, get out. I said what I said. Uh, Mackenzie, <laughs> do you want to explain this polo spellhouse collab? Uh, oh, my oh God. okay. I mean, I don't disclaimer. I don't know why y'all was hot on social media about it. I thought the Polo Morehouse Spellhouse collab was super cute. It was very traditional. If you haven't seen, I'm sure you have. But it was, um, I guess what people were saying, civil rights, or I don't want to say that. It was they just saying, really early saying, please please black people, babe. They were yeah, saying clothes were but, gonna fit in, but that's Polo's whole thing. So I don't. Yeah, with their so brand identity. I thought it was really cute. I mean, of course, as all Howard alum, they should have definitely partnered with Howard instead. But we're more of an off-white okay, so I, I did want to actually. <laughs> we're not I remember really polo. freshman year. Freshman year in the bookstore, it was like we I don't know. Polo. We had the, polo shit. We had polo shit in there. I don't know if this was official, but I literally was mad because it was a a, a collared uh, polo, and it I had remember because it was Howard, expensive. Word. No, it was expensive. Yeah, they had a Howard patch. That joint was hard. So, like when I seen this, I thought it was of the same nature. I think it was more of the rollout, just like the roller. Like, like I don't know if y'all they saw put this real mo- They put real money behind this. They have in yeah. mo- their big flagship stores like New York, Georgetown. You know, big flagship stores. They have this on full display. So for me, it just communicates like we kind we know who our core audience is i'm just curious and what is that i mean uh, you said what no what, no, what is our core who is our core audience like they the were black, elite? black people with this release so like oh I oh oh appreciate okay. them like showing that and not like kind of putting us in the back of the store and displaying that like that you yeah know what I'm i think my thing is like okay, people see, who, stood behind it. yeah i think my thing is for the people who are upset about it like what what would you have wanted to see from that 
that went south or that went not as expected? Because if so, then either you just didn't want the collab in the first place, but then you can't complain about how big brands are not partnering with black and like it's it's just it's it it's makes no sense running in circles. I think people it makes no sense. Happy. I promise it's not that hard. Um, but yeah, and honestly, the video of even Ralph Lauren sitting down and talking about like even that, like I, I thought it was really beautiful, like just con connecting how I love when people always say like we're also Americans too. And I just also feel like, cause when it comes to immigrants and people who came to this country and then they're finally Americans, I just liked how he tied in that black Americans are a part of the, a part of American history. We're not just black history. We're not just this, this little section over here. So I really like that video. Yeah, really. Um, but yeah, and for the Howard people, there was an 1867 sweater yeah. that's going to be out and you can finesse that and it can be Howard and his Navy was cute. Oh, as I said, what color is it? How much it is? Now it's like navy. I'm definitely gonna look into it because it was kind of fire. Yeah, but yeah, I love cool. the collab. Because my Bellman, that the S sweater, that was cute. That yeah, was real classy. With the Spellman, uh, she graduated first from Spellman, and she was like sharing her pain with me, and she was like, "Yeah, I like it. I don't." She was basically a girl with us, um, in terms of like that, and she said she about to like stay up and buy like a couple pieces. So like, oh yeah. You know, that's going to be all the graduation pictures. People all the graduation saying, pictures. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, and this is like an investment, too. Like, also, that was something, that's something I would pass down to my kid, for real. Especially yeah, the Letterman, yeah. even though I don't support Morehouse. But um, I just, uh, Morehouse may be questionable, but that's neither here nor there. But if I did go to Morehouse and I did get that, like, that's stuff that you, whatever. People can't be satisfied. But I will say, I will say that I do understand the people who go to the other HBCUs that always want more attention for their school. I do see where they're coming from, but I will say that it's important because in that video, when they're talking about the whole campaign, it was, he specifically said, these are my coworkers. These are people who I work with who've been on my team. A lot of the people who put together this collab and advocated for it went to Morehouse, went to Spelman. So I just say when it comes to like- eight, Get your alumni game up, bro. That ain't nobody. I don't, I don't want to say it like I that. Even think it's it's like... I think it's different. I think, and granted, like, I think this is the, this is what I have noticed. Granted, I am around more Howard people and that will cloud my judgment on this. And I know exactly. people <laughs> No, but what I can at least say is I know I've never seen anyone rep their HBCU harder than Howard. Even when I talk to other people who went to HBCUs, if they went to NCAT, fam, you people rep it really hard. But other than that, like, our people are going to let you know that they went to like how, like the Howard women made the tournament. I was telling it. everybody and their mama, Howard about to get smoked this weekend, but we made the tournament. If I went to Texas Southern or like I would be always public facing about it. And I think the people who are always saying like, okay, you know, Tuskegee or Tougaloo don't get the same love. That is that that is very true, and there are reasons why that is true, largely based on ge you know geography and location. But I do not see those people. Howard people will honest like. Even in their worst moments, Howard, you don't know we, went to Howard. we still go. Yeah. Don't talk about my school. Other, yeah. HBCUs, I'll be frank, they don't have that, and that's like the harder kind of touchy feely thing. But like, so can I ask y'all a question? I'll, 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 oh, go ahead. Um, do you think they ingrained that into us, or is that like something we all came with and we were all like? I'm going to Howard. I think it's the culture of Howard. People love, I feel like people love Howard. Like, I genuinely love my experience. I mean, it's definitely some nonsense that goes with Howard, but I do think it's the culture because when I do meet other people who go to other HBCUs, and people have even said this about Howard, and especially in New York, like, wow, like the Howard people are actually like, it's always love when I see somebody. It's never like, I'll see other people and people like, well, I also think our class is like that though in general, but I'll I see other people. Hard. You think it's cultural? I really think it's. Cool. I just, yeah, I think it's cool because I'll be out with other people and they'll, if they've been in class with them, they probably won't say hi if they're not that cool with them. But I can't see if I, somebody, at least in my class, that went to Howard, even if I wasn't cool with them and I saw them, I'd still say hello. Hey, what's up? How are you? Oh my God, let's, you know, like yeah. it's, it's something there. So I think it's in the culture. But I will say when it comes to also the other HBCs being included, I also think, and unfortunately, in my experience, when I'm working at different companies, the people that be at the table who went to HBCUs, it really do be Howard Spellman, Morehouse. Yeah. You so might get ECAT like, and FAMU. 
I, I worked with people from NCAT too, but so but when it comes saying, to proximity NCAT or family, yeah, yeah, I yeah. I don't be, and and Hampton, that's, that's what Hampton I'm saying. Hampton be up there too. Hampton, Hampton, but overall, Hampton it really do too. be, but it really be that handful. So like, I feel like if I was a white person, I don't know nothing about HBCUs. And I'm constantly working with these few people that went to these same schools. This you know, I, mean. I just feel like that's, that's what I mean by get your alumni you know? game up though. Like, I'm not trying to, I don't know how that came off. It could be pompous. It's very Howard yeah. whatever. But like Richard, the point. Let's see. That, huh? Howard being in DC has a huge advantage. Just like Spellman and you know Morehouse being in Atlanta has a huge advantage. You're easier able to get a well. And our alumni, our alumni. That's that, that. I'm gonna say that, Mackenzie. I'm standing on that. Because it's Martin Luther King from Morehouse. Obviously, white people know that. You got Thurgood Marshall from Howard. So you already have these type of figures that they have been archived. But then you could say they have literally been archived in history. You could say, uh, or no, that might be Hampton, and then the other one, Tuskegee. My black I history. I power so much, even just talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, I'm not trying to be rude or pompous, but like Tim McKenzie's point, like I, I know people that went to different HBCUs that aren't as, I don't want to use the word that they use, but um, tiered as Howard. So with that being the case, um, I feel like, from my experience, these people down their experience, they don't like the fact that they went there. I wish I would have did this or that. It's hard for me to thrive in my career. I don't really have no connections or that, this and the third. And I guess in my experience with my HBCU, like that's never been the case. Like I can go kind of anywhere and have on a Howard sweater or the fact that I'm in a fraternity double downs on it. But like, it's like, you went to HBCU? Well, I don't know, like, you know what I'm saying? Even people that didn't go to HBCU, if I have on my, I mean, people that went to other HBCUs and I have on my Howard sweater there, oh, I went to HBCU. Da, 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 and they'll come yeah, up. I definitely always show love. And that's another thing I hate when that conversation, because me personally, when it's another HBCU and I see somebody, oh my God, we're already here. Yeah. We're already here. <laughs> I'm going to show love. But then we, never mind. But yeah, I feel like that it's not our fault. It's a part of the culture. I feel like when they get when we get to Howard, you go to Howard University. This people person's with there, that person's with there. You're walking in the legacy of this, that. Like it's it's not it's kind of not you. They mold us to one degree or another. I'm not sad yeah. to say it. I mean, I think it's like I think it's a bunch of different things. I think it's like one Howard. I mean, to be frank, Howard is a private institution, and a lot of people who can go to Howard have the ability to go to Howard. And they are already coming in with a leg up. I mean, no, you can scoff your face, but that's real. Like, we all know a yeah. lot. We all know a lot of people. Because all of them schools is bougie as hell. All three of them that we I, just made. Okay, can I say this then? Because I guess this was my experience at Howard. Because, like. Your your experience is not the whole. You know. Yeah. You no, no, no. This, what I'm saying is I came from a pretty middle class family, right? And when I came to Howard. <clears throat> I feel like I, I seen the whole black diaspora as a whole because you had the lower class people who maybe couldn't afford it, but they got in on scholarship or had a personal connection or whatever the case may be. And I know it's changed now. Howard, when I was there, is not the same as this Howard because I would say this Howard is very much of that. You had a leg up. For me and my friends, I, I feel under, like I think you're I think you're underestimating just kind of how. Hey, I could be. I can only speak from my perspective, but I feel like it was a. It, I felt every wavelength. I feel like that's why I say molded us, but it was also something in us too. Like all, all of us had drive, ambition to become something better than we started as type all thing. And, and the thing is, like I, I functionally agree with you. I just think like because we're in DC, because it's a private institution, because a lot of people's families have the ability to. Where unlike if you wanted to go to Howard, but all of a sudden you ended up at, I'm just going to say if you ended up at, give me the HBCU, if you ended up at Tennessee State, Fisk. I'll just say, or Fisk, Tennessee State or Fisk, that's a state school, there are just a different level of reality that you're having because you go to a state school. That is largely because it is either you're making a financial decision that I can't fault anybody for, that's a real choice that people have to make, which is oh, why sure. a lot of us, me, are sitting here with loans and shit, so like, I just think it's like, there's like a lot of different conversations that go into like location, economics, the ability of people who are going to Howard, which we can't deny is higher than average of every other HBCU, which gives you a leg up. And like, 
it all plays a factor. Yeah. It all plays a factor. Because Howard ain't cheap. It sure ain't. Shout out to Aid Vantage, who is currently holding my student loan debt. Um, I don't know, bro. But I do, I will say last point, I do feel like when we do sit at the table, I do, like, if we are having a conversation about HBCUs, I do try to inform people, like, there are other HBCUs other than Howard, like, there are other things. So, like, I don't know, I'm just over the argument, but I do say I'll share the word of other HBCUs that are often overlooked if we're talking about other HBCUs. But um, yeah. I mean, I do my best. I do my best. Apparently, my tagline is "I'm Henry and I went to Howard." It was mm. a joke. It's closing. It. it was a joke. Fell flat. <laughs> Fell flat. <laughs> <laughs> there it you was go. a joke, bro. The next we uh, the next episode uh, you will find uh, Mackenzie and I talking about Top Boy fan fiction. So if you watch the show, please get at us on Twitter. Uh, anywho, that was episode number. 83. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at WRGOPod. Be sure to like, listen, subscribe, and comment on any of your favorite streaming platforms. That includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, and Google Play. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube, where you can watch our lovely faces on the backdrops of our apartments in full. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>